There it is. My colleagues have been killed, murdered. Our work, yours as welfare workers, mine as a doctor, isn't concerned with politics, creed. All we want to do is to bring help to the sick and suffering on either side, whether they're Muslims or white settlers. We live in desperate times when brother kills brother. We are caught in their crossfire. But our work must go on. Well, I think that's all. I say good night and remind you that the villa at LBR is our new headquarters. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. We didn't have time for our game. Dr. Sorrell. I shall not come here any more on Sundays. Why have we had any trouble? No, I want to avoid trouble. I don't want you and Elian to have difficulties. I should be, but old friends, colleagues. Mm, that's what the whole of Algiers is afraid of. They have an interest in keeping us apart. I mean, all of us. No, they, they talk of fraternization, but they prefer subjugation. They're all afraid of peace. Sounds like the port. Oh, it sounds like trouble. Yesterday morning, before my lecture to the third-year students, I found a note in my locket at the hospital. It said, Dr. Carter, your turn is coming. Was it in French? No, <laughs> Arabic. You any idea who wrote it? Doesn't matter, though. It's all anonymous. The unsigned letter, the bullet that hits you in the back of the neck. It doesn't really matter whether it comes from white settler rebels or Muslim terrorists. I'm sorry, very sorry. Doesn't mean anything. Everyone gets these threats. Everyone who's loyal to constitutional government. Maybe. But I am concerned for my friends. I shall not come here again after tonight. Don't want you to exile yourself from our house. Not for our sake. You will always be welcome here. Oh, I've seen this view for many years. I've seen armies come and go. My family settled here a hundred years ago. I am 67 now. My age, I'm not going to change. To run. That's because a bunch of rebels, whether they're Muslims or white settlers, want to get rid of the legal government. There's someone on the telephone. Is it for me? No, they're asking for Dr. Carter. Oh, who wants me? I don't know. You'd better ask them. She doesn't mean any harm. Will he be staying for supper? I know quite well that Dr. Carter always goes home before curfew. What have you got against him, Francesca? Nothing. Will he have the cold chicken? Yes. What have you got against him? I don't trust him. Why not? I don't trust any of them. I'm afraid I've got to go down to the port. Is it essential? Yes. Someone's thrown a grenade into a cafe. There's some women hurt and a child as well. Telephone the hospital. They oh. send an ambulance. <laughs> These are Muslim victims. The settler rebels would never allow them to reach hospital alive. I must go myself. In your own car? No, they're sending a taxi for me. Well, I'm much more likely to respect an ambulance. Yesterday, a Muslim was shot in the middle of town. He managed to crawl into a police station. A settler gangster followed him in, finished him off in front of the police, and got away. They wouldn't respect an ambulance. Do you want me to help you, Dr. Carter? Oh, thank you. I can manage. But perhaps if tonight I could borrow some equipment, it would save me a journey. Well, of course. Thank you. I'll come in. Oh, no, you mustn't. I can't trouble you. Well, you don't mean that. <laughs> Hello. Oh, my dear. Father, where are you going? I'll tell you, Anne. Don't wait summer for me. You ought to let Dr. Lanyi take your night calls. She's much younger than you are. Well, I must go. Don't worry. I shan't be late. Isn't Hugo with you? Oh, he had to go back into town. He'll be back later. Look after yourself. If anyone says stop, you just stop. <laughs> Right. The tax is here.
How did it happen? You, how did it happen? What is your name? Salon. Has it hurt, Salon? No. Give me your hand. Can you stand up? Tell me, Salon, do you like to play football? Could you kick a football now? No. Who is he? You can't treat them here. Then they must die here. The child, too? What's the matter with him? Transvas lesion. Mm. Typical traumatic paraplegia. Get him to the hospital. How? I tax it. Oh, no, you mustn't. It's far too dangerous. But he'll survive it. I don't mean for him. I mean for you. I'll survive it, too. How long will you be away, Hugo? Three days. You'll see the children, won't you? Of course. You said that last time. I promise you will this time. It's just that I'm so damn busy on these short trips. I'll manage it somehow. I promise. I wish I was seeing them. But I must make the most of my time over here with Father. What was he up to last night? I don't know. Some night call. I stayed awake until I heard him come in. You shouldn't go out late at night. It isn't safe. I keep telling you. Keep on telling you. Well, you know how stubborn he is. The natives shoot first and then steal the passes. It's becoming really dangerous for him. Look what happened last night. Now what happened? Threw a bomb into a Cafe Victoire. Six dead, twelve wounded. Somebody tried to throw it away, but it was too late. Another thing, I think you should tell him to give up his association with the welfare workers. Why ever should he do that? Because he's coming into contact with the communists. I thought they were supposed to be I don't know what they were supposed to be, but they're communists now. He'll hate it if I suggested it's his life. It's for his own sake. Try and persuade him. Hmm? Well, I'll try. I hate these short trips. When I'm away from you, I want to be back. This time I don't want to go. What time does your plane leave? Ten o'clock. Something I meant to tell you. I can't remember what it is. Probably remember on the plane. I must go. There's always a hold up getting out to the airport, and I don't want to miss the damn thing. Take care of yourself, Hugo. I just remembered. What? What it was I meant to tell you. I saw a friend of yours last night. Who was that? Paul Dupre. He told me to tell you he was coming to see you. I think there's a slight infection. Is the catheterization normal? Yes. Did you change his position, as I told you? Every three hours. It's all right. Thank you, Dr. Lenny. Well, Salon. Now, come on. I've come to make you better. Don't you want to hear about Ahmed Harkin? The footballer? Yes. You know Ahmed. Oh, he's my very best friend. Tell me about him. But Armie tells me he won't be playing in the cup next week. Why? He broke his leg playing in the trials. I can't move my legs. Can you shoot with a bow and arrow? No. I'll teach you when you get better. But I like football. Does anything hurt, Sally? No, it doesn't hurt. Has your mother been to see you, your father? My father's a soldier. He's away. Your mother? <laughs> Ahmed wouldn't cry. When Ahmed gets hurt, he just laughs. He laughs? Yeah. Yes, yeah, like that. I don't think I believed Hugo when he told me. I can't believe it now. Uh, it seems a long time since I stood on this balcony. Let me look at you. I was in love with you then. You're even more beautiful now. Well, you haven't changed much. Hmm? 
You still look like that young lieutenant I first met scowling in the corner. Oh, yes, I was scowling at Galloway, if oh, I remember right. Tom, the American colonel. Yes, wrong man. I should have been scowling at Hugo de Crecillon. Trouble was, I liked him. Well, he liked you too. Let's sit down, Paul. Oh. Would you like a drink, a whiskey? Yes. What are you doing in Algiers? Everyone else is leaving. You arrive. I'm here to write a report on the state of our museums and ancient monuments. Good heavens. It's quite true. I'm a civil servant now. I can't see you as a civil servant. Well, why not? There are worse disasters than working for the Ministry of Culture. Thank you. When did you get married? Soon after the war. You happy? Oh, good. It's back early. Out here, Father. Out there, you know. It's most unwise. Father, look who's here. I'm sorry, I didn't realize. It's Paul, Paul Dupre. Oh, my dear fellow, how very nice. What a very pleasant surprise. A very pleasant surprise to be here. You're looking splendid, Doctor. Well, I'll come out of the balcony. Where are the drinks, Eliane? We've got ours. I'll pour one for you. Do sit down. Okay. You'll stay for lunch, of course. I've already told Francesca. She grumbled like mad. I think it was just to cover her excitement at seeing Paul. Well, I hope you're right. I've always been frightened to death of her. <laughs> oh, she's mellowed quite a bit, hasn't she, Father? Probably. Living in the same house, I'm not conscious of any change. What are you doing in Algiers, Paul? Well, I'm uh, here to write a report on the state of our museums and ancient monuments. Officially? Oh, certainly. I'm a civil servant now. I see. How long will you stay? Well, several weeks. Well, you must come and see us often. There's nothing I'd like more. Of course, I do work civil service hours now. Where are you staying? Oh, they uh, they stuck me in at the Hotel Constantine. Oh, I know the one, down by the port. Yeah, it's rather a dismal hole, but it's only ten minutes from the office. Lunch, Francesca? No, another fifteen minutes. No, this came for you, Doctor. Who brought it? How would I know? They pushed it under the door and rang the bell, and when I opened, there was no one there. All right, Francesca. Will you excuse me? Of course, sir. What is it, Father? Well, it's nothing, nothing of any importance. May I see? Yes, I'll show you, it's not important. I observe, Mr. Boudet, that the class is somewhat tired today. Mr. Genre, could you explain why the class has become immobilized? I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, that my class has abandoned the excellent tradition of rising to greet the lecturer. Its purpose has always been to show respect for science. I'm sorry. Very sorry. And, uh, let me see. No. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I propose to tell you today about closed spinal injuries with incomplete paraplegia. You saw in our last lecture, in compound spinal injuries, especially when they're due to gunshot and shell wounds, the main purpose of early operative intervention is the removal of foreign bodies. I will illustrate that.
Three months ago, a soldier was admitted to the hospital 14 days after being hit in the back by fragments from an 88mm shell. A complete transverse lesion at T11, laxic procedure, and uh, there was a wound mentioning. I assume that you instigated this demonstration, Bidoni. Oh, the demonstration was spontaneous. We merely disciplined it. I cannot understand its purpose. Oh, its purpose is quite simple. It's to give you notice, Dr. Sorrell, that we're not going to let you put your skill as a doctor at the service of native terrorists. Terrorists? My talents have never been placed at the service of terrorists. I'm a doctor. I serve the sick. That is all there is to it. Please let me pass. Not just yet. I'm quite finished. Who are we? We are white patriots. Patriots to our country here, not a thousand kilometers away. Patriots to the country our fathers built. And we object to you preserving the lives of men who are killers. In your spinal ward, you have eight Muslim terrorists. I never ask the politics of my patients. I do what I can. God knows it's not much. For anyone who is brought to my ward. We believe you harbor them. No. That you give them medical supplies and care. It is not true. That you give them sanctuary at your clinic at Bel Air. I receive only men and women who are sick. And that five days ago, you personally brought a Muslim into your hospital. It is true. An eight-year-old child, paralyzed from the waist down, with a wound. I have nothing more to say to you, gentlemen. But we have something more to say to you. We give you three days to clear your beds of terrorist wounded. That's impossible. I told you I don't ask whether my patients are Muslims or anything else. They cannot be removed. In that case, we'll move them for you by tomorrow night. If I refuse to let you. That'll make things a lot easier for us, but I must warn you, Dr. Sorrell. We're not going to stand for any more of your communications with monkeys. That's all there is to it. You can go. Something I ought to say to you, Bidoni. I'm an old man, and you're a young one. I've now very little left to lose. Our life is already spent. If you and your friends want to shorten it by a few years, well, while I live, I shall live by my own standards of what I think is right. You have asked me to fail in my duty as a doctor. To join with the killers. To kill by default. My answer is no. Oh, what a lovely day. Will you really get into trouble for taking the day off? No. <laughs> Are you hungry? Yeah, I could be. Oh, it's Francesca's night off. I never can find the switch. Well, I missed it, yeah. Oh. Oh. My darling. When did you get back? Didn't you get my telegram? There's been no one here all afternoon. Guess where we've been. I have no idea. But you both look very well on it. Sunburned. Blooming, in fact. Sensational, as the children would say. Would you like a drink, Dupre? Well, thank you. I'd like a whiskey. Eliane, you haven't asked me about the children. Oh, well, give me a chance for me to do my hair first, and then I'll ask you everything in detail. How are they? Water. I'll do your hair. Please. And how is Paris? Oh, it's another world. Not necessarily a better one. They're all very concerned about the Contessa's divorce. Hmm. Otherwise, they're thinking of their summer holidays. Do sit down, my dear chap. It's not long ago they were coming here for their summer holidays. Well, we were at the beach today. Oh, yes, I can see that. Did you swim? Yeah. What did you do for transport? Does the civil service run to a car? I get a pool car whenever I want one. Although today, I must confess, we used yours. My dear fellow, provided you don't mind the risk of being mistaken for me, it's rather a distinctive car. You can't work in Algiers without running risks. It takes a certain courage, I think. Yes, up to a point. But there are times when even that doesn't help. Yes, that's true. I suppose it doesn't require courage to get a bullet in your back when you're not looking. How are the reports coming along? Oh, very well, thanks. What else do you do for amusement? I mean, apart from swimming. 
Oh, nothing much. I have a few friends. Have you tried Lucifer's? Where's that? On the other side of the city. You can get a room there for the night. I have some rather attractive girls. Now you can tell me all about the children. Well, they told me they were very well behaved and going to communion regularly. Did they like their presents? I don't know. I only spoke to them on the phone. Oh, Hugo. And it couldn't be helped. I had to get back a day earlier. Yes, of course. I'm just disappointed for them. I did go to Paris on business, you know. Well, I'm exhausted. I've had a long day. Will you excuse me, Dupre? I have to get up early in the morning. There's no need for you to go. Well, there is, and for the same reason. Besides, it's quite a step down to the port. Well, look, why don't you stay the night? We've got a spare room. Yes, Paul, why don't you? Be safer at this time. Yes, well, that's very kind of you both. I really think I should get back. Besides, I have a perfect technique for walking about the city late at night. What's that? I walk fast and say my prayers loudly. <laughs> Good night, my dear chap. I'll see you up. Good night, Paul. speak to your father about going out at night yes i i did i tried hugo i really did but he just laughed where is he now at one of their meetings well if you won't listen to reason what do you make of dupre it's very nice gets on very well with father i can't understand why they should send a man all the way from paris to to report on monuments and museums at a time like this does he talk about his work hardly ever why I don't know, there's something curious about it. Something about him I don't like. Well, you don't have to. I don't see why they should stop us talking to each other. After all, we've been friends for 30 years. Dr. Sorrell, you really should leave the city. No, I should never do that. Believe me, it would be for the best. Oh, never. But I need your advice. What about? The paraplegic boy, Salim. Oh, his mother died, you know. Yes, I heard. Dr. Carla, I want him to be taken to my clinic at Bel Air. Oh, that's too difficult. They I wouldn't... want an ambulance with a Muslim crew. I want the destination to be marked Intel. And I want him taken to Bel Air. But why? Because unless he goes there, he will die here. But it's dangerous. It's very dangerous for you. Don't mind about that. You'll have to sign the discharge form. Oh, yes, I'll do that. Against my better judgment, I'll, I'll arrange it for tomorrow morning. No, no. It's afternoon. Must be this afternoon. Three o'clock. Very well. Three o'clock. Thank you.
You never talk to me. Never take me anywhere. You've been here four times. Five. Now, there you are. All you do is sit and drink. But you don't drink much. I don't even know you draw. Well, it's very dull, civil service. I'd much rather hear about you than talk about myself. Uh, who your friends are, that sort of thing. My friends? Well, yes, if you like someone, you naturally want to know about their friends. You are jealous. Are you jealous, Paul? I could be. Mm, that's sweet, that really is. Go on, tell me. There's nobody you stupid. I know everyone who comes here, but no one gets near me. That's not important. You can do that and still belong to yourself. No one gets near me. Let's have another drink. What about all these um, young men? I don't like young men. What do you like? Like you. They boast. What's wrong with that? They boast. They come here and they boast. About girls? That's well, perfectly natural. No, not about girls. They boast about killing, that how many they've killed. It gives me bad dreams. Sometimes afterwards they've turned to me and boasted. It's true. That one over there. I don't point sweet. You mightn't like it. That's army dog. Mm -hmm. You remember the welfare workers who got done in last week? Yes, very well. It was in all the papers. He killed them. How do you know? He told me. It was funny. He didn't say anything. They all came back here afterwards for a drink. Then he went and lay down in the bed. I went and had a look at him. He was crying. Then he fell fast asleep, and when he woke, he was all excited and bragging like a man who's been with a woman. Isn't he one of the Donies, lot? You want to know too much. Oh, well, everybody knows about Vedoni and the welfare center. I know Vedoni, and if you want to know, I wouldn't let him touch me. Why not? It's complicated. He used to come here, but some of the girls got frightened. Why don't you ever come inside with me? Aren't I attractive? Oh, you're very attractive, Maria. But now I have to go. I don't want your money. Well, save it for me, hmm? All right. When are you coming again? Tomorrow or the next day. Try and come tomorrow. Yes, I'll try. So, uh, do these boys come here every day? They come to see their girls every day. After work? After their sort of work. Makes me sick. Why don't you stay for me? Bye, Maria. There can be no doubt that the disturbances have made a lot of people fed up at home. They're tired of the cost in money and men. And we must face the fact that our own demonstrations in France, the plastic bomb and so on, haven't had the effect on the government we'd hoped. But strangely enough, and Hugo will have his own report to make, there is a widespread approval at home amongst our kith and kin of the settlers' struggle here. Where there isn't approval, there's at least sympathy. Does this suggest that we should confine our demonstrations to Algeria? I think not. It's in France itself that our voice must be heard, not just Algeria. The explosion of a plastic bomb in Paris ought to be the maroon to alert the nation to its danger. It's our way of voting no. No to defeatism. The government would like to surrender Algeria to the native gangsters, but it can't turn its paper agreements into reality unless it has the settlers behind it. And that's where our strength lies. As long as we're united, the government settlements here are worthless. So the fight goes on. Now, don't ever forget that the native rebels are still the enemy, even though for the time being we have a quarrel with the government at home. But first, let's deal with the enemy here on our own doorstep. We must put the fear of hell into them. We must tear the mask from the Muslim terrorists so that they can be recognized as the same filthy swine that disembowel pregnant women, slit the throats of our children, castrated our farmers and burnt them alive. The same native terrorists that we've been fighting for six years. Now, the days to come will be a challenge. We're all soldiers, although I'm the only professional among you. Still, today in Paris, they call me ex-General Palice. I'm under sentence of death, so you see, I've got nothing to lose. But you, some of you, have a great deal to lose. 
You must know that there are only two choices in our struggle, and one of them is victory. Now we'll take the tactical report. Vidoni. It's a short one, General. The arms searches and the individual arrests have gone on. They're sending more security police from home. 1,500 troops will arrive at the port on Friday. Tell the meeting what our losses were last week. Three killed, 18 arrested. Their losses? Eight security police, 12 intelligence corps. We executed 16 of the enemy, including 10 at the welfare center. And the police reaction to this? No. Well, that, sir, is the extent of my report. However, if I may, I'd like to put one or two thoughts to you on the situation as a whole. Yeah. We're at a point where fear is becoming a condition of life. And as with all conditions, people accommodate themselves to it. When this happens, it ceases to be effective. We need a new psychological shock which will transform the situation politically. If terror is to succeed as a political weapon, it must exceed anything the enemy can offer. Well, we've had the balance sheet from you. It's not bad. Yes, but it's not enough. At this moment, they're sitting tight in the Kasbah, refusing to fight. They think time is on their side. So we've got to provoke them. We need a major clash. We've got to get them down to the city and start them fighting. And how do you propose we do this? By provoking them. I want your agreement, first of all, to withdraw the orders to our commandos against the execution of women. Women? Yes. Their whole intelligence system is based upon information supplied by Muslim women working in the European areas. I suggest the time has come for us to execute demonstratively a certain number of Muslim women. But, Danny, don't you think once we start executing women, we're going to have the whole world public opinion against us? Public opinion? The only public opinion that has any importance for us is Algiers today. Outside of that, nothing matters. Here, General, is a list of women informers. I'm asking for your authority to our commandos to dispose of them. What I want to see is the deliberate elimination of 20 women who have been identified as the enemies of French Algeria. If we do this as an act of policy, the Muslims will move down from the Kasbahs to the city where we'll be waiting for them and the army will be forced to join in. And if they don't? Then they'll be labelled as the sons of bitches they are. Cowards, too miserable to defend their own women. They'll never raise their heads again. It'll take a lot of thought. I don't want to make a snap judgment. I'm asking you. No, Madoni, you've had my answer. You made your point. I'll give it my attention. Now, let's turn to something more practical. Finance. Hugo, how did things go at home? Not at all badly. I've received checks and guarantees to the value of nearly 10 million new francs. Where is he? He's in bed asleep. Is he all right? Yeah, fine. Tired, but in excellent spirits. How's the theatre? Oh, I don't know. I don't like gala occasions. I only went because Madame Roulin asked me. Hmm? Nice surprise to see you. Why are you here? Your father invited me. I'm glad. He's very fond of you. Yes, I'm very fond of him, too. Pour me a drink. What would you like? Brandy. You've been having a party. <laughs> there were other people here too, you know. There was Maitre Varin, the lawyer, Monsieur Boutard, the former mayor of Algiers, Monsieur Gabello. Gabello, the trades union man? Yeah. Oh, I don't understand. They met to form an association to rally what your father calls central opinion. Isn't that just like him? He never gives up. Do you know he hasn't breathed a word about it to Hugo or me? Yes, well, it now formally exists. Calls itself SCG, Supporters of Constitutional Government. The next step is to draw up a memorandum stating its aims and issue it to the press. Oh, that's splendid. Why do you say their next step? Well, I'm a civil servant. I can't join a political group. Now, your father simply thought that I might be able to offer some advice. And did you? Very little. I tried unsuccessfully to dissuade him from accepting the chairmanship. Why is it wrong? You know, it's not wrong. It's unwise. Why well, don't you see? This is a new political association. In his age and in his position, he oughtn't, he oughtn't to invite trouble. Is it as bad as that? Well, not necessarily, but it might be. I wish you were going back to France. I've been thinking that ever since he got that note. No, well, he won't go. He's dug his heels in. Well, thank you for telling me, Paul. Yeah. Look, you try and persuade him to give up the chairmanship. He'll listen to you. Tell him you want to see more of him while you're here, something like that. Oh, he won't listen to me. Hmm? Hugo wanted me to make him give up his meetings with the welfare workers. He just laughed. Well, there's another problem. What's that? Hugo wants us to move from here. He wants us to take a villa outside the city. 
Oh. What's the matter? I simply think that your father would be safer if your husband stayed here. Why? Where's Hugo now? Some company business meeting. He's always going off at a moment's notice. He'll be back tomorrow. Well, I better go. No, not yet. It's late. I don't care. Oh, they're all liars, all of them. There's only one way to deal with them. Kick them in the teeth and they can't talk. You better tell your father-in-law. What should I tell my father-in-law? He spends too much time with the wrong people. He's got a lot of black thugs at the hospital. Well, he's a doctor, not an administrator. It's not satisfactory, not a bit. You tell him. Doctors who keep murderers alive, the ones that try to kill us, it's no good. But only there's nothing wrong with Sorel. He's an old man whose only interest is medicine. There's something else I think you should understand. What? Nothing is to happen to Sorel. That's an order. You ordering his protection? That's all I have to say to you, Vidoni. And what if there's an accident? I shall hold you responsible. You know, you really are enlarging my sphere of responsibility excessively. Time to disperse, gentlemen. Curfew in 15 minutes. Your cars will be waiting. Hugo, you'll Good stay night. till the curfew lifts. Yes, of course. Good night. Good night. Good night. Oh, let's have a drink. We may as well see the door now. What do you make of Vidoni? He's a ball. <laughs> yes, he's that all right. Well, those are the people who get things done, the obsessive ones, the bores. Thank you. He's an ideal revolutionary. You know, it imposes a great strain on one. Three years ago, I commanded an army, and now what? The deserters and corner boys. Your health. Ah, oh, there it is, Hugo. The Bedonis of this world are a necessary evil. We have to accept them. Yes, I suppose so. What have you missed most in your life? <laughs> That's an interesting question. <laughs> you seem to have everything. A successful career, home, marriage, children. But a crossy or one of the oldest families in France. I have two children. Well? Both girls. Ah. Yes, I'm a de croission. We were brought up from an early age to believe that we... You know, we belong to a class which has been frequently misrepresented. I'm added into the middle classes. Oh, well. Marrying into the middle classes is an old convention. It's how we continue to exist. I didn't marry for money. I married because of a great physical attraction. And Eliane is a wonderful wife? I loved her with an intense feeling of possession. Do you know there was a time when I couldn't even bear a man to speak to her? But you loved her. That must have made it all worthwhile. Yes, but it lay side by side with the resentment that my life would never be what it was meant to be. I suppose I was largely to blame. My wife, her family, her bourgeois background, were opposites to everything I stood for. Does she know how you feel? Oh, yes, she's aware of my resentment. And we live with it. What would you do if your wife went off with another man? It would be simple. I'd kill him. Where's Armidal now? Outside. Any trouble? No, he was at Lucifer's. I told Mickey to tell him that a girl outside wanted to talk to him. He came straight out and we nabbed him. Funny what some men will do for a woman. Yeah. Has he talked? Not yet, Major. We were waiting for you. He's been drinking a lot. By now, he'll be very thirsty. All right, let's have a minute. Hello? So, it's you, you bastard. I should have guessed it. Sit down, Armidar. Mr. Armidar. So this is damn familiar. So your name is Jean-Pierre Armidal. Age 24, military service. Who said you could smoke? Father, small settler. Law student. Anything else about There's him? There's not much else. He's a pelabadoni, hangs about a lot in bars, no criminal record, but he likes the girls. Oh, and no one should get shot for that. The difference between us, dear boy, is that you have to pay for it. I get it free. Well, that's an interesting thought. 
I think we'll have a few words with Mr. Armidal alone. So you're a great success with women? Well, they do better with me than with you. Let's leave it like that. You mean talking to Maria? Yeah, Maria told me that uh, a dirty police spy who paid but didn't perform was asking some questions. And that she made up a few answers. Well, that's very ingenious. Tell me, Amida, what would you like most at this moment, apart from wanting to smash our faces in? A glass of water. A glass of water? Extraordinary how simple our needs are when we come to break them down, isn't it? A glass of water. Well, you'll have one. When you've answered a few questions, you'll have your glass of water. He likes girls. Do you remember Mademoiselle Lacasse? Yeah. Then I'll remind you. She was one of the health visitors, one of the welfare workers. She dragged herself away after the shooting and lay dying for 15 hours, without help, without water, with two bullets in her lungs. They would have killed us. They were communists helping the natives. Oh, I see. You mean these 12 people, eight men and four women doing welfare work, were murdered Execute. for being communists? They were, in fact, socialists, Catholics, liberals. But you say they were communists helping the native terrorists. That's it. So you lined them up and shot them. Well, I had nothing to do with it. Uh, I only heard about it later. But it was right. They were helping the enemy. Who gave the order? Go to hell. Could you give me a glass of water, please, Van? Gave you that order. Nobody gives me orders. Maria told me. Maria's a lying whore. Didn't you know, old boy? All whores are liars. Why don't you grow up? Who gave you that order? Now, right, you listen to me. We've got until five o'clock till we put you on that plane for home and for a very long stay in jail. Before then, you're going to tell us everything you know. Now, do you understand that? Everything. I'll tell you nothing. Not a thing. He likes girls, Major. Look, I don't know what you intend. I can only tell you, old boy, that the, uh, the Minister of Culture and your present boss have said that the torture must stop. Well, nobody's going to torture you. Just want to ask you a few questions. Why did you join the settlers' organization? Well, let me put another point to you. You're a law student. No, I'm registered as one. I uh, keep getting interrupted. You want to practice law? If I live, yes. Don't you take up arms illegally against your government? Uh, you make me sick with your sanctimonious humbug. You know damn well there's one right that transcends everything else. The right of rebellion in favor of a moral law. During the war, didn't uh, didn't you fight with the resistance? Yes. <laughs> well, there you are then. If I were a lawyer, this would be the moment when I jab my finger at you. But what's the difference between us? Tell me that. Up to a certain point, there's no difference in principle, but there's a vast difference in fact. You see, we fought with arms against soldiers. You massacre unarmed civilians. Who gave you that order? 
Oh, come on, Amidal. Who is it? I have nothing to say. Is it ex-general police? <laughs> you have plenty of time. Look, you'll get nothing out of me. Listen, perhaps you can't understand. I'm here because I'm a volunteer. You're here because you're a paid police spy. I don't think so. Yeah, well, you can answer for yourself. All I can tell you is that when we volunteer for something like this, we're ready to kill and be killed. And anything else you can think of. If the idea's right, it's bound to win. Yes, that's why you're going to lose. And they're making a fool of you, do you know that? All these banks they've been raiding and holding up, what do you think's happening to the money? They're sending it to Switzerland for safekeeping for themselves. That's so well, right. the truth, we know it. They're paying it into private accounts. While you're doing the dirty work, they're looking after themselves. You ask Hugo to cross you. The cross has nothing to do with... I'd like some more water. So you know de Crassillon? Well, I know him, yes. Yeah. How well do you know him? He was a friend of my father. What about it? How much did he pay the execution squad? Go to hell! Well... Between now and five o'clock, I want you to find out from Mr. Armidal who ordered the welfare worker's job, how much the killers were paid, and whether Hugo de Croissillon is still the official paymaster of the settlers. Yes, Major. They're paid very well, you know. I think they ought to know back home just what the rate for the job is. You leave it to me, Major. Anything else? No, he's small fry. I, I wouldn't tell him much. Just enough for me to tell you the whole lot of you will soon be blown to hell. It's a bit my hotel. I'll deal with him, Major. I hear you like girls. They've done it for us. French soldiers killing French civilians demanding their rights as Frenchmen. The government's finished. It's finally condemned and we as settlers are vindicated. We've got our martyrs too, 37 martyrs. They haven't died for nothing. The importance of what has happened today is, is it gives us the green light. Everything that happens from now on is our justified reply. We've got to wait until the general gets back. Why? We've got to wait until the general gets back from the south. No, not a bit. We've got to answer at once. And how do you propose that we should do that? Operation Sunset. That's our answer. That's too much involved. Look, I know exactly what's involved. This is the moment. If we wait, we'll be lost forever. Oh, de Croissillon! There's one other matter I wanted to mention to you. And what's that? You better tell your wife to stop seeing that fellow Dupre. What's my wife got to do with Dupre? I mean, Dupre is a police spy. Yes, your friend. Old Sorel's friend. The wife's friend. She's been seeing him. She's been visiting his hotel. He's going to get hurt, so tell her, keep away. I'm going to be very frank with you, Dr. Sorrell. In that case, you must look me in the face. I'm anxious about you. Why? Because you're Elian's father. Why should that give you any cause for anxiety? Because you're behaving foolishly and compromising her. In what way? In half a dozen ways. You've been consorting with the Muslim, half unconsciously, I imagine, with the Muslim terrorists. Dr. Sicada, we now know, was the head of their medical services in Algiers. Sicada, excellent friend of France. Fine doctor. I'm certain it's had nothing to do with politics. Look here. I'll try to talk to him. No, you can't. It's, it's too late. Why? He was killed this afternoon in the Boulevard Biron. 
Oh, that's not true. I'm afraid so. But who? It was a bomb. Poor Cicada. I spoke to him only yesterday. Well, that's how it is. I was telephoned to the hospital. No, you can't. The lines have been disconnected. It's a power failure or a strike, one or the other. It's terrible. Terrible. Poor Cicada. There comes a time when you envy the dead. You must get Elian away from here. So good have been here now. They're murdering everything that's best. You must take her back to Paris, no, Hugo. We're moving away from this apartment, but not home. We're moving into an hotel. That's no good. You must leave this city, both of you. No, I can't. I've got at least three months' work here, and Elian is. Well, Elian wants to be with me. There's something else, something I want you to do. And it's as much for Elian as yourself. For Elian, I'll do anything within my power. I want you to give up your chairmanship of this new movement. You mean supporters of the constitutional government? Yes, and take a plane and go back home. We'll give up the chairmanship now, just so the movement's getting on. Before it's too late! But I man, you're out of your mind. We've already got the interest of the Employers Association and some of the trade unions, too. Who? Oh, Boulay and Gimbello and the others. And what's the programme? Capitulation? No, cooperation. Cooperation with the communities. That's the government's theme. Listen, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm trying to tell you as solemnly as I can. If you want Elian to have a father, you must give up your chairmanship and go home! That's impossible. I've accepted it. Very well. This afternoon, Elian and I will move into an hotel. You will not see or speak to her again in public. Do you understand? Why not? Because, Dr. Sorel, you are in serious trouble. You go. Elian, pack your things. We're moving into an hotel this afternoon. What happened? Nothing. I asked him a searching question, that's all, and he burst into tears. Very soft, the new generation. He made a voluntary statement dealing with the next list of executions. He couldn't remember them all, but he knew a few. What did you do? Nothing. I know my order, sir. He's got a delicate stomach. Dr. Sorrell? Yes, he's priority. Who well, when's it for? They need higher authority before they start. They're waiting for police to get back from the south. The code word is sunset. Well, when's he get back? Not until Thursday. But, Major, that's three days. Francesca, where's Madame de Crecillo? Oh, in the... Uh, Here, take this. Uh, you all right? Yes. Who were they? I don't know. It all happened so quickly. Darling, I think they've got your father. I've got to find him. Now, look, I'm going to put a guard on this house on no account of you to leave it. Paul! Do you understand? Francesca, did you know them? I mean, could you recognize them? No, I, I don't know. They, hmm? they had guns and they smashed his spectacles, broke his walking, and they hit him. 
and punched him. They hit him Take and care. punched him. Oh, Jesus. It's all right. Miss oh, Elia, oh, it's too rough. It's all right. Lieutenant Baron, please. Baron, it's Dupre here. It's sunset already. I cannot plead because I do not recognize this as a properly constituted court. We'll see. I think you'll find in a few weeks' time that there are no other courts but ours. This bears as much resemblance to a court of justice as a, a black mass to a mass. I doubt very much whether you, Dr. Sorrell, are qualified to make the distinction. But never mind, we'll give you every chance to rebut the charges. I repeat, I do not recognize this court. It's a travesty to legitimize murder. We will proceed to the examination. De Croissant. Dr. Sorel, you've treated a number of Muslim patients at the hospital and at your clinic in Bel Air. That is true. I have treated very many. For wounds? For wounds and injuries. I have uh, specialized in paraplegias. How many of your patients were native terrorists? I don't know. Why not? I never asked. Why not? The duty of a doctor in his specific activities is to preserve life, relieve pain, and uh, restore his patients to full health. Nothing else. There's no duty, or even right, as a doctor, to pass moral judgments. So a thug who is wounded when he attempts murder deserves the same treatment as his victims? If I ask in sense a doctor, the answer must be yes. In other words... He must be morally neutral. If a Muslim terrorist and a white patriot lie side by side in your hospitals, you would give them equal treatment? Yes. Irrespective of the murders he has committed? Yes. Tell me, Sir Earl, since we've established your professional impartiality, how much money did you receive in payment from the terrorists? I've never taken money from the terrorists or from any other political organization. Never. Oh, you spoke about being morally neutral. Does that apply to the doctor and politics? In his treatment of his patient? Yes. And outside his hospital and his consulting room? The doctor is also a citizen. He has civic duties. That's why, no doubt, you set up your organization with a barbarous title, the uh, Supporters of Constitutional Government. Oh, I didn't think it was a bad title. <laughs> I thought of it myself. Well, you're not on trial for your literary talent. You're charged with being a traitor. I'm afraid we only have half an hour because of you. Verdone. The man in front of us, Dr. Sorel, is a man for whom in my time I've had great veneration. I am sorry to be his accuser in court today. He was my teacher. And if he never taught me very much, I must hold myself partly responsible. I think we'd better get on with the indictment. The charges against Sir L. R. That he accepted money for treating Muslims. That he conspired with Sikada to provide medical care for our enemies. And finally, and this, Mr. President, is the gravest charge of all. He gave shelter, comfort, and information to a police spy, Paul Dupre. Now, I know this man. Whatever he says about medicine and morals, he has used his reputation in order to promote objectively the policies of the killers. The day ever comes, God forbid, when we see our kith and kin forced to leave the city their fathers built. When we see the Muslim flag flying over the cathedral. When we see the altar desecrated by a mob trying to make it into a mosque. And I say, gentlemen, this man, Sir Earl, will bear a terrible responsibility. Algiers is, in its way, a, a small city. My grandparents knew Dr. Sorel and esteemed him. And there's hardly a single family which has been here for over 50 years which hasn't, at some time or other, had professional and social contact with him. That makes his crime the greater. He could have helped us. He chose to help the natives. As a doctor with an international reputation, he could have made his, hers, his voice heard abroad. In Paris, Washington, London, he chose to remain silent. For months we were forbearing. His own prestige, the prestige of his son-in-law, were his protection. But we warned him. Don't let anyone say we didn't warn him. We sent him messages, but he persisted. He thumbed his nose at us by forming his absurd organization. 
He openly consorted with police spies, especially the ones that kidnapped and tortured Ahmed al-Paul Dupre. That gentleman is the nature of his compassion, the extent of his impartiality, the measure of his humanity. We've condemned and executed others with less ceremony and for lesser crimes. The future will say of us that in the heat of battle we were still generous enough to give him a fair trial to give him what he and his friends denied our medal. Sorel, gentlemen, is our Eichmann. I ask you to give him an equivalent sentence. You are entitled to a spokesman, a defending officer. Now I will speak for myself. Well, Zarel? I have nothing to say. If you will hear me, I will say it. I am an old man. I am not concerned to say anything but the truth. I have seen death many times in my life as a soldier, as a doctor. My work is almost all behind me. But you will be doing something different. You are a young man. You know nothing of life. So far, you have dedicated your youth to death. The time may come when you'll be sorry about those wasted years. Ah, oh, get on with it. I don't think you'll ever become a doctor. You'll never pass the qualifying examination. You won't have to mark my papers. I've marked yours. But I won't deal with that. Let me now deal with the, uh, with the charges. If I'm accused of carrying out my duties as a doctor, then I must accept the charge. I have treated uh, Arabs, Negroes, Spaniards, Frenchmen, everybody was brought to me or came to me, or I went to sea. Who say that some of these Muslims were uh, members of the terrorists? Maybe. I never asked or sought to know. I treated them because they were suffering men and women. I make no apologies. I have no regrets. What is the next charge? That you acted as a liaison officer with C. Carter, the head of the terrorist medical office. I can only say it's untrue, of course. Uh, I consorted with him. He was a friend and a colleague. It is also true, and I don't deny it, that uh, after the explosion at the Cafe de la Porte, I helped him to treat some Muslims who were injured. Did you treat any Europeans? No, they were otherwise careful. The Muslims were afraid to be carried to our hospitals. Isn't that a reproach? Reproach to civilization? To you as its representatives? Isn't it a reproach that these undeveloped Muslims, you should call them, but afraid to be taken to our hospitals? To be founded on charity? The charity that you now try to defend? I say now, and I, I couldn't say to them. They have a right to be afraid. They have a right. Not to throw themselves on the mercy of such people as you, who pursued, pursued the men to the hospital and killed them on their beds, who followed the ambulance and killed the dying on the stretchers. Let's hear any more of this, Mr. President. Yes, let's hear him out. You have accused me of treason. Was it treason when I and my friends have the Allied landings during the war? No, because there comes a time when revolt. It's a moral duty. But if each of us is to demand the ideal state of our own making, well, it's anarchy. No, it's compromise. We accept the state most tolerable to our ideals. And what sort of state is that? A state which respects the rights of human personality. One in which patricidal hatred and violence is replaced by brotherly love and cooperation. And is that how you see our present government at home? Oh, no, not yet. No, but our country, well, it still stands for something great in the world. And the torturers and the security men, what about Paul Dupre? I am certain Dupre would never lend himself to torture. Never? At the time of the landings, a captured naval officer held the plans for the minefields outside Sidi Farouk. Would you have tortured him to enable the troop carriers to come in? To save 5,000 lives, would you have tortured him? Would you, Dr. Sorel? Perhaps, perhaps I might have been weak enough to do so. 
that a country must not be judged by the weakness of individual beings, but by the ideals that it has to serve. Gentlemen, I'm afraid we will have to adjourn. The situation at the moment is that sunset is going according to plan. But the security forces have countered with radio silence. They've made some captures and are making a large-scale search of LBR. The roadblock at Ben Atmoon will not be open until six o'clock. We will disperse in the general direction of Afreville with rendezvous point at Boom Edford. There is something else I would like to say. Well, what now? Where would you like to go? Well, uh, where are we? Near Ben Atmoon. Well, I think I should like to go to my clinic at Bel Air and get some spectacles. I have a spare pair. And I should also like to see my patients. We thought of that. If it's possible, you shall. Come on. When Dr. Sorel is ready. The first hint came from Armadale. He admitted knowing a chap called Lebrun. There are scores of Lebrun. Oh? I expect that's why he didn't worry much about mentioning the name for Palis's aide de camp, but I thought it might be worth following up. Anyway, we were lucky. We tracked a man to a new block of flats in the Rue Daguerre. Who did you have A with military you? squad. We knocked on the door, no answer. And uh, then? We went in all the same, pity about the door, pretty fancy apartments, but we bust in, and there were these two fellows just standing there, absolutely still. And then Inspector Gabler said, You're Palis to the tallest one. He didn't answer, and we knew we got him. What did he do? Nothing. He just stood there. He was wearing a blue suit and holding a soft grey hat in his hand. They must have been on the point of leaving when we got there. Palisa dyed his hair, but we were absolutely sure. And then? And then we put the handcuffs on, and that was that. Well done. Yes, well done. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. They're finished, Paul. As long as they were invisible, they had authority. Once they made the mistake of coming out into the open, I think we might celebrate. What about a drink? Well, not just yet. Still lost to Crisillon. All we know is he reached the port. Well, we've got 1,500 men down there just waiting. It's only a matter of time. Is there uh, any news of your friend, Sorel? None, no. It's a general alert. There are special squads out, but I'm not hopeful. Mm. He was on their list. Yeah, he was right at the top. Might help his chances if we could break radio silence. No. No, the scenes he wouldn't have it. Not for one man. It's working too well. Look, Sorel is not just one man. Yes. Yes? I see. Right. Thank you. One of our patrolmen was fired on from a black car travelling from Ben Noon in the direction of Bel Air. His motorcycle was put out of action, but he thought he spotted an old man wearing a Panama hat in the back before the others opened fire. All right, Paul. Bug. Go with him. Where have you been? I'm afraid I've been busy. How is he? Salem's fine. No pyrexia for days. Next week he's going to play bows and arrows. Oh, that's good. Will you shoot me, Salem? No. I won't shoot you. Never shoot anyone. No one. Thank you. You have a pair of spectacles, Dr. Sorrell. Oh. Thank you. It's pure joy being able to see again. Without one's eyes, the whole world seems curiously unfamiliar. I got some good news for you, Salem. What's that? Algiers beat the racing club 3-1. Who scored? Lorandi, Dubois and Plesch. Which half? You mustn't worry, the doctor. Lorandi in the first half, Dubois and Plesch in the second. Dubois and Plesch in the second. He's tired. See that he gets the arm um, shoulder exercises? Yes. It's very important to exercise the other muscles. Yes. Goodbye, sir. Time's getting on, Doctor. How about saying goodbye to us in the gymnasium? No, we don't want you. Go and look after your other patients. You stay here, Dr. Lanyi. You have a lot to do. Don't go. Good morning. Good 
Do what you have to do. Oh, of course, it's the court's decision. Lord, I got. Lord. too late. It's funny. Louise ended her last letter to me, your ever-thinking daughter. I always know what she meant. Oh, I should have made him go back to Paris last week or the week before. I should have insisted. I didn't want to go myself. I didn't want to leave you, Paul. Oh, I should have made him go. I could have. I know I could. Oh, I don't know what to do. You're going back to Paris. I can't go. Hugo won't be coming back. Perhaps he will. No, I've told you it's impossible. He's been arrested at the park. <sighs> I still don't want to go. Look, there are better things for you than staying here. For you and for your children. And a thing for the memory of your father. He wanted you to go back to Paris. He told me so only yesterday. Come now, we must hurry. I want you on that plane now. Sure. 